and we're just going to get set up. Graham, could you just grab that stool over there for me? The stool? Yeah, the stool. You're going to use this one? This, little, this young man doesn't like the limelight, right? The Lord has this habit of bringing him into it, right? And doing amazing things through him. I want to say this before Jamie speaks a word, and I want you to value every word that comes out of his mouth. He has a gift. And I say it in all sincerity, he has a gift to be able to speak the Father's words over people. So whatever he is about to say, whether it's planned or not, whether it's through tears or through laughter, uh, there'll be tears. We've got, we've got two boxes of tissues, brother. Is that going to be enough? Two boxes? <laughs> so I'm just going to pray for Jamie and we're going to throw it over to him and uh, we're going to hear what God's been doing in this, this man's life. Stand with me and pray if you'd like to. Father, we stand as one with one who has come to know you as Lord and Saviour and it has blown his mind. The dots that he used to connect have been thrown out and now he has a new set that he's working with of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Father, we ask that you'll come and stand at the front of this church, place your hands on him and release his voice to speak. And we all said, Amen. Amen. So you just got to keep it up near there, man. Is that all right? Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even think I've even seen this done, never let alone do it. Yeah, look, Matt told me uh, don't write anything, just just uh, speak from the heart. And um, I'm lucky I didn't write anything because the week went very messy towards the end of it, you know, and everything I've written would have um, been useless. But um, I, I don't know. The, you better help me here. What? what my life, I don't know what is this, my life, what Jesus is doing in it. One of the things I love about Jamie is that there's no preconceived ideas. He doesn't know how stuff works. <laughs> that can be helpful. Amazingly helpful. So eight months ago or nine months ago, he walked into this church uh, because God laid a word on your heart, didn't he? No. <clears throat> Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll start with um, how I came to God, and it wasn't in the church. And um, if I'd ever been taught or told anything about God, I, I never heard it, never remembered it. I didn't wake up one morning thinking, yeah, I want to be a Christian, I'm going to follow Jesus, and um, this is going to be my life. 18 months ago, I never would have thought of coming to a church um, look it got messy this week and I'm still reaping what I what I sowed you know and I've only just become a Christian so there's a lot of mess still out there you know and um, I don't have my son here for Father's Day but um, we'll go into that a little bit later you know um, without my son's mother I don't think I'd be in my son's life. I'm guaranteed I would not be in my son's life. He would not be in my life, you know. Um, I did have no one in my life. It was just me and it's been just me for the last 30 years. And, um, you know, look, my father brought himself up and um, I think after paying for a good education for me, I was left to bring myself up, you know, and at the end of the day, I didn't know how to live. Um, I saw my, myself in my father and I started to see um, myself in Connor, you know, and, and things were 
were an absolute train wreck, you know, in my life. I, I just didn't know how to do it. Um, I tried to change my life plenty of times and I think it had got uh, a lot further down the track than being dead in sin. I, I knew I was going to die, basically. Um, I'd got to such a point where I don't know, the soul inside me was checking out. I was going, mate, I've had enough. I, I cannot do this anymore. And um, I was living a lifestyle, I suppose, where you find ladies that are handing out pamphlets, and it was pamphlets um, with verses from the Bible on it. And I remember the first time this lady gave me this pamphlet. I just broke into tears and I think it had been about 30 years since I'd cried. And it happened two or three times to in the end I used to send my cousin in to say I can't go in there anymore. <laughs> I'd just be a wreck, you know, and um, I knew things weren't right but I, I didn't I wanted help, but I, I don't think I really wanted to change. I just wanted help for my circumstances. And um, yeah, look, I, in the end, I was that distraught, and um, Conan was, was going to be taken out of my life, or I had to be t removed from his life. Um, and I got to a point where I, I said a prayer, you know, and the. the because I always believed that there was something out there, there was some God, you know, and I spent my whole life not being whole and trying to fill it with every, every single thing I could, but it just didn't fit. There's nothing that, that goes in there except God. That's what's supposed to, to fit in that, in that space, you know. And, um, yeah, this was my prayer. Give me a reason to live. <laughs> and... Uh, not being a Christian and not knowing, I now understand what that reason to live is, <laughs> and it's starting to hit home, you know. So um, there was the uh, the repentance, I suppose. It's the first time um, that I'd ever really wanted to change, and um, to me, that's what it what it was. It was the changing, not just wanting um, help or. Yeah, it was the change, it was the being willing to change, you know, so I had to put um, some steps in the play here to to have a look and start to change my life because I, I knew, um, I, I knew I just couldn't go on that way and watching this continue on from my father to myself and I see it in um, other parts of my family but I'm seeing it in Connor, I'm thinking, mate, this has to stop. You know, there has to be a, a, a better way, a different way. This, it just doesn't feel normal. It doesn't feel right. Um, yeah, look, I, I started to um, believe then, and those pamphlets, I suppose, hit me, and I started to come to... I started to get waves and I suppose the Holy Spirit and I started to get healed and things started to happen and I started to actually see um, where God was in my life, you know, and I think it came from crying out for help and um, because I've been very isolated coming into here, even isolated coming into church as well, I, I don't know any other Christians really, you know. <laughs> um, uh, then, uh, look, uh, I was praying for God to put some people in my life in front of me, you know, to lead the way. Because um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. And um, I ended up here at um, Haberfield Baptist Church, and a few people know the story how I got here, but was well accepted and um, they asked me how, how was it when you came here like you know did you feel comfortable this and that I said I don't think you had much choice it wasn't me that decided even to come I felt like I was picked up and taken here you know and um, 
oh, I think I found the right place, you know. Look, the, there's a few people too that have helped me, um, even just coming in here, like from, from not knowing anything. And like Stan saying, read the Bible, Matt helping me saying, this is normal, you know, and I'm going, this is not normal, mate. I don't know what's happening with me. Um, yeah. Um, the first thing, one of the first things I read out of the Bible was uh, a psalm, and I just related to it, you know, and um, it could have happened in a more romantic place, but it happened in the middle of a train station, you know, and um, I think I was that empty that when this hit, that it was overwhelming. Um, I related to that psalm and something happened, and I do believe that God, God, you know, he hears those the, that heart open and you cry out. And I, I think several different things, he, um, the other types of worship there are, he hears that and, and he's present through them, you know. But when this hit, I was bent over, dry reaching, and um, I was getting filled up with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and it was insane. And I, I stood up and um, I knew instantly it wasn't me. And to me, it, it, I don't know, I, I refer back and I like that word, the Holy Ghost, because I could feel it. This was Jesus living inside of me. He had entered my body, you know. Mm -hmm. And instantly, I knew it wasn't me doing anything, you know, like it's 11 minutes to the train and I'm helping a blind lady to the exit and lifting the bag upstairs and saying hello to this. I thought, none of this is me. Like, what <laughs> is going on here? You know? So I started getting, I don't know, I say to Matt, bombed with this, you know, and um, life's sort of changing. I'm healing. Um, I'm starting to cry for the first time in my life and I'm sitting down with my son at school and he's in trouble and I feel like I'm in trouble too, sitting on the little seats. <laughs> um, and we're talking, you know, and I, I feel the presence come from above again and it comes right through me and into my son and we're both crying and I've turned around to Matt and I was, it's happening again. What is this, Matt? And it keeps filling me up and I think I was that empty. And I'm like, is this my dad? Is this Jesus? Is this the Holy Spirit? Because I think at that point and that moment as well with my son, it was like, this is what I didn't get from my father, you know? But I was there to able to give it to my son, you know? And a lot of this is about my son, um, not so much me, and I know he's working through me, but... Um, yeah, look, from some of these things, I, I know that I was that empty and it's hit me that hard that it's like, well, where do you go from there? There is nowhere to go from there but forward, mate. You cannot ignore that or leave that behind, you know. Um, I will come in into church and I just I felt a bit silly because everyone here is a Christian and I'm going, do you know this is true? Do you know this is true? <laughs> because I'd never read the Bible, you know, and I relate to it. What seems to happen is it happens first for me and I experience it and then I'll come across where, where it's written or where it's said or, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. Look, it's Father's Day and my son's not here and um, I know I have uh, a long way to go but it has got, you know, messy. I got down here, yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Matt's helped me get rid of the ugly with God, and I'm doing some work there, but now even the bad is starting to look ugly, you know. So it's it's about the change, and I thought, Matt, I, I can't really get up there because I don't have enough growth, you know, I'd, uh, and I suppose I'll never stop growing, but I don't want... Um, look, Matt knows what it was like, and already it's chalk and cheese, you know, to come from where I've come from and from what I've seen and what I've done to just be present in my son's life is unbelievable. Um, 
Uh, what else have I got down here? I don't have my son here for Father's Day, but I've got a card I got from him, and I'd just love to read this out. But it says, I love you. I love you, Dad, because you love God, and you love me, and you love everybody. <laughs> now, it's a bit over the top, but I'm not going to burst his bubble. <laughs> Because I, I spent my life, I think, trying to imitate my father. And if I can now be in a position where I can have my son to try and imitate me to, somewhere along those lines, I feel God's working through this space, you know. And it's not so much what I got for Father's Day, I was blessed. When God entered my life, I now look at my son and I think it's what my son got for Father's Day. And what my son got for Father's Day is a father. Amen. And to me, that's what it's all about. Amen. Right, so. So Jamie's made a song request. <laughs> Just hang on. Gee, how can I top that? <laughs> Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm five, starting at verse seven. By, but I enter your house with abundance of your faithful love. I bowed down toward your holy temple in, in revengeful awe of you. Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my adversary, adversities. Make your way straight for me, straight before me. I used these verses last Sunday morning uh, with our, we did communion, oh sorry, Kiss Church, thank you, off and running, how good is our Kiss Church, yeah, and how much do we love Lorraine and all the teachers, <laughs> we've got a hallelujah from Craig down the front. Yeah, so I used these verses last Sunday morning, we did communion, and um, when we went away on this, this retreat, like half the, more than half the guys had never been on a retreat before, and there's so 11 of us and six had not been and five had. And, and so when you lead something like that, what you really desire and want is for the whole uh, 11 to actually feel what we've had before, but then you go, maybe that's too small. And so you end up getting to those retreats and just say, Father, your will be done, and let's just see what happens next. And I think that's what happens next. So we hadn't planned on baptising Jamie, had we? It was a good five degrees in that water. There's something beautiful about that. And um, if you ever get a chance to baptise someone, regardless of the temperature, do it. Like it's cold to get in and it's painful to get into. But once you're in that moment, I didn't want to get out of it. Maybe my legs have gone numb by that point, but... Um, there is something very powerful about standing with a man who just loves Jesus, wants to be identified by Jesus and is willing to stand up and say, I'm up for it. And to stand with, that, with, with Jamie on, on last Saturday afternoon and then uh, what you didn't see on the video is all the guys praying for him after he, afterwards uh, and, um, and you, I just stood there as a pastor not needing to pray because everyone was just powerfully just speaking words into this man's life. And as a pastor, I felt very proud in that moment. Um, not because of what I've done, but because of what I saw. And these are guys that call me family. Uh, these are guys that are willing to put up with me uh, and just love me. And uh, you might not think that's a bad thing, 
Um, but if you ask Trish, that's a hard thing, right? Gabby's laughing, so she gets it. But when you are in a, a room of love, crazy things start happening. Life starts tra transforming. You find it very difficult to um, communicate, as Jamie has said. What words can you say when you feel loved like you've never felt love before? It's impossible. You don't even have a language for that. You don't even have words to say that because you've never used those words before and, and you're feeling things that you've never felt before. And, and like Jamie was saying, what's going on here, Matt? This is not right. What is going on? And I'm saying to, to, to Jamie, these things are of the Holy Spirit. And some of the things that he's feeling, I've never felt before, but you know what? It's some of the things I've felt, he's never felt before. And that's just what makes us unique. And that's why we're the body of Christ. And that's why we're together. And that's why uh, when you hear 10 men praying over one guy, you hear 10 voices coming through 10 different lenses of speaking powerful things over the kingdom of God. Is that not, is that not a good thing? That is a great thing. Because the kingdom of God is inside of this man. The kingdom of God's inside of you here today. And if you can't find it, then you've got to actually stop to listen for it because it's, it's right here. I've, I've titled this message this morning of having dinner with the king or dining with the king. I heard a number of years ago a minister preach, it could have been my dad, uh, I don't know, but they speak out a thing of saying something like this, if you're going to have dinner with the queen, would you not dress up for it? I, I, I want you to... To, to think about that, like if you're going to have dinner with the queen, you wouldn't be wearing your tracky dacks, would you? you? You might, you might leave the UGG boots at home. The flannel would probably stay in the wardrobe. You know those favourite clothes you have, what you get into when you get home. You, you wouldn't wear those, would you? Can I show you a picture of dining with the king? Can I just show you that picture? I want you to see it. This is my version of dining with the king. You may not be able to see that very clearly because of the glare. But that's 11 men and having dinner last Saturday night on a very big table and Christ was there. He didn't care that I was wearing tracky dacks. He didn't care uh, that I hadn't done my hair that day. He didn't care. He was just pleased to be there, that is having dinner with the king. The, the Bible says in, um, in the book of Matthew, uh, and so if you go looking for the, the, for the Lord's house, if you go looking for his dinner table to have dinner there, the, Jesus comes out with this cracking statement. He says, the son of man does not even have a place to lay his head, so don't bother looking for the table. If he doesn't even have a bed, he does not have a table. But the Bible says this, uh, that if you love me, that you'll obey me, and, and the Father and I will come and make home with you. So have a guess where the table is. It's right here. He's crafting the table. He's making the table. So think about scripture where Jesus went for dinner. How often in scripture did Jesus invite people around to his place for dinner? That's right, Bev, none. No one. And you might think that's inhospitable. Surely Jesus should have invited people around for dinner. We didn't even have a house. Right? So here's how Jesus did it. He's walking along one day and there's a guy up a tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, I want to have dinner with you tonight. And Zacchaeus goes, okay, oh, that's, that's fine. We can do that. So guess where the Lord's table was that night? That's not a trick question. Zacchaeus' house, where he does life. Isn't that cool? With Zacchaeus' friends. Uh, what about um, the feeding of the 5,000? So the Bible says that Jesus comes across, goes across the lake and he steps out of the boat and there's 5,000 people in front of him. And what does he say? He doesn't say, where am I going to go get a meal? He says, we're going to create a meal. So 5,000 people sit down to eat at the Lord's table, which was where they were. It's a no-brainer. 
the Last Supper is a crazy one. Because uh, Jesus just goes to his disciples, just go into town, find a dude, find a donkey, and you're going to be led to a, a room. It's all going to be set up, ready to go. That's scary prophecy right there. But that's what the Father's all about, right? And so there's Jesus, and he's at the table, and the Bible says in John chapter 13, he gets up from the table, and he shows the disciples the full extent of his love. At somebody else's table, he demonstrates his love right there at the table. The last time Jesus has a meal that is recorded in Scripture is, is where Jesus is finding Peter after the resurrection. Do you remember that story? Jesus has gone fishing and Jesus walks up to the edge of the water that day and he calls out, have you caught any fish? And, and, and Peter goes, haven't caught a single fish. And Jesus is like, that's no good because I'm hungry. You better try fishing on the other side of the boat and that's like saying to a carpenter, can you use a left-handed hammer? It's crazy talk, but, but Jesus is saying, I'm hungry, let's get some fish. And before you know it, Jesus is sitting around a campfire with Peter, asking Peter, do you love me? Dining with the king does not like, look like sitting with the queen. It looks like sitting with a bunch of guys that you can't really see there on a table that's far too big. That table is so big you can't reach across it. So when someone says, can you pass the sauce, you've got to throw it. <laughs> but I want to tell you what's at that table right there. And you've heard what's at that table. There's family at that table and none of us were related. We are now bound together by a stronger form of blood than there is that can flow through my vein to my boy's veins. Do you know whose blood that is? The blood of Jesus, right? And when you become family with Jesus, you can't unengineer that moment. You are family. So whether these three guys here, like it or not, who have declared themselves as family are now family and they can't unengineer that, that thing because Christ's blood has bound them together. Okay, what causes a man to stand up here and say, I went looking for friends, but I found family, and he goes to tears? Do you know what causes that? The love of Jesus. And sometimes you can't teach that, you just got to see that, right? So on Thursday night, I'm sitting with my Bible study group, and there's four of us from Bible study that were on retreat, and I had the four of us speak out what happened on the retreat, and before you, I, before you know it, there were six other people in that room that desperately wanted to be on that same retreat. Is that not right? Dave, was that not right? Who else was there? Trish, was that, that not right? Miriam, was that not right? And you just hear it and you go, you know what? I just want to be where that is. Why? Because something of the kingdom is happening and these guys just can't get the proper words around it and they just keep crying. You know how much I love crying. Because hearts get seen when tears start flowing. And so around that table is love, right? It's right there. And it's in the moment. It's in, it's in the moment. You don't plan these events. You know, in these last few weeks, I have been so busy. And I apologize to the guys for this. I've been so busy and I forgot so many things when we went away. I got there and with the first study, I had done no preparation whatsoever for it. And these guys go, so what? It's not you we want to hear. It's Jesus. Who puts me in my place. Does it not? And before you know it, God starts doing stuff. And like, uh, I forgot the amp for Pete's piano and he couldn't play it. And this thing weighs a ton, right? Carried it, got it all the way down there and, and I forgot the, the amp. And there's this old piano there that's out of tune and whatnot. And I'll tell you what, we had that thing singing. And we had 11 men just singing. And if you could just imagine 11 men just so abandoned to Jesus that they just dropped their sheets to start singing. Before you know it, you don't know what's coming out of their mouth, but it's a great noise. It's a song. And there's love that's been sung. There's abandonment that's been had. There's abundance right there in the room. And right there, Jesus is dining with us. Is that not right? Is that not what the Bible is about? Is that not what you can see of the love of Jesus? You see this, when Jesus dines, abundance happens. So when Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' place, abundance happens. This guy can't help but be changed. And when 10 guys come away on a retreat, those 10 guys are marked by Jesus. That's why I see it. 
because in that retreat, as the change has been designed to happen, why wasn't there 12 guys? Because 11 guys were meant to go away. Why wasn't there 15? Because 11 guys were meant to go away. And those 11 guys, as, they, as Pete said, as we made ourselves vulnerable, as we opened ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, can't help but change. That's just what God does. That's just what God does. And Jamie keeps on saying to me, Matt, is this normal? I don't know. I don't know. What is normal when Jesus is in town? I don't know. Is that not worth an amen? amen? Jesus sits down with 5,000 people. Does abundance not happen? There are leftovers. Jesus sits down with 5,000 people and he says, what have we got? And they steal a young kid's lunch and make an absolute mess out of it. So much so, 12 baskets of food are picked up afterwards. Is that not abundance? Jesus gets up from a table at the Last Supper and shows the disciples the full extent of his love and he goes to wash their feet. Is that not abundance? Where Jesus is willing to give up all so that he can serve. And Peter goes, but Jesus, that's too much. And Jesus says, you are not getting my version of abundance. Huh. Peter sitting beside the Sea of Galilee with so many fish that the net couldn't hold it and Jesus was obviously very hungry and he only needed one fish but got hundreds of them and before you know it, when Jesus sits down to eat, abundance starts happening. It starts happening. The Bible says this of Jesus, or Jesus says this of himself, he goes, you know what, some of you guys think that John the Baptist is uh, this strange dude out in the wilderness that, uh, well, he eats wild locusts and, and, and eats that honey, right? But of me, you call me a glutton and a drunk. That's Jesus. What does that say about Jesus? Can I just ask that question without being, putting heresy on the table here? What does that say about Jesus? If you're going to be accused of a glutton and a drunk, do you think you're a dude that just loves wild locusts? I would say you're a guy that enjoys his food, Right? Jesus was accused of being a glutton and a drunk. Now, for us in, in the Baptist world where we don't do alcohol, or lots of people from our tradition don't do alcohol um, because we think that steals our fun, um, that blows us our minds, does it not, to think that Jesus, well, he enjoyed his food. He enjoyed the meal table. There's something of abundance in Jesus that we've just got to tap into. And at that table, we tapped into it. At that table, uh, we were fed, right? On that table, um, there's no alcohol on that table. And if you filled that whole table with food, we'd still be there eating it. That's that big, right? But there was a feast on that table, was there not? And, and the feast looked more than food. Uh, the feast was men who put their hearts very much there and said, you know what, I'm willing to trust you in that space. And I can just imagine Jesus standing there at that table or sitting at that table and going, I'm pleased to be here to see this. The question that's often asked, though, in these sort of circumstances, how do you, and, and Cindy asked me this, says, how do you activate that space? So thank you, Cindy, for saying that word over my life. You're awesome. You received that? How do you activate this father heart? Well, I just want you to imagine for a moment um, you're at Zacchaeus' table. So what's not recorded in Scripture is what happened at the table. So what's recorded is Jesus says, tonight I'm having dinner with you, brother. And then the next thing, uh, Zacchaeus has given all his money away. So something profound has got to happen in the midst of that. Isn't that right? So here's probably what didn't happen. Here's probably what didn't happen. Jesus comes over for dinner and says, Zacchaeus, mate, this is great food, excellent food. And you've got a beautiful place, Zacchaeus. I, I just really love this place. You obviously spent your money on, on your house and, and there's some nice artwork and, and, and this food, my gosh, it's divine. I haven't tasted food like this since I've been in heaven. And, and Zacchaeus, you're just such a great guy. You are such a great guy, and you're such a welcoming guy, and I'm just so pleased to know you, Jesus. And then Zacchaeus turns around and goes, awesome, I believe. Let's just give away all my wealth. 
I don't think it happened that way. Maybe, maybe it was something like this, where Jesus sits down at the table and he goes, Zacchaeus, you're a beautiful house. You really do. The food is, is truly divine and it's just beautiful. But I'm just wondering, Zacchaeus, um, do you know how most people feel about you? Um, they don't like you. In fact, if I could be so bold to say is they, they hate you, how does that make you feel as a kiss? And now Zacchaeus might have gone, well, you know what, I've got everything I need. I've got, I've got my, my house, I've got my food, I've got my friends here and all that sort of stuff. But Jesus goes, yeah, I get, I get Zacchaeus, you've got everything you need that you think you need in the moment. But how, how does it make you feel? What's going on inside of you, Zacchaeus? Can we just talk about that for a moment? Because what I'm about is actually seeing you being set free so that you can be alive in God again. And somewhere in that space, somewhere in that moment, the Holy Spirit comes on Zacchaeus like a wave and somewhere Zacchaeus starts going, you know what, Jesus, I can see it, I want it, I desire it, but I'm so locked into my ways, I'm so locked into what people think of me that I don't know how to get out of it. And Jesus says, let me show you the way. I want to say to you, Zacchaeus, that you are forgiven. I want to say to you, Zacchaeus, that your past does not need to define your present nor your future. I want to say to you, Zacchaeus, that you have been loved even if you've never been loved before. And I want to give you new words for how that actually looks and that shapes. And so when Zacchaeus bursts open the door that afternoon to everyone else who is actually condemning him, he starts being generous. He starts giving away everything that he has put together, everything that he has relied on, everything that has been his identity. And in that moment, you see the power of the Holy Spirit take a guy who was utterly lost in one afternoon. And by the end of that evening at the table, dining with the king, He has been transformed. Is that not the coolest thing you've ever heard in your life? Is that not just fantastic of what God can do? Is that not why we are here today? Because we know that our God can do miracles and he loves, loves us. He loves us. That's just the phrase of the song. I've just used it three times for repetition so you get it. He loves you. He loves you. And he loves you. So if you want to know how to activate it, you've got to kind of do a Mary. Mary and Martha, does that ring any bells? What does Zacchaeus do? He had to find himself at the table with Jesus. Eleven men gave up a weekend. And if you know anything about these eleven men, some of them are going through some really tough stuff. They found themselves at the feet of Jesus, did you not? You testify to that? You found yourself at the feet of Jesus. Zacchaeus found himself at the feet of Jesus. 5,000 people found themselves at the feet of Jesus. And what did they receive? You know, if you're one of those 5,000, you just heard that Jesus has got five loaves and two, two fishes, and he's actually going to split those up for you to feed. You're thinking, my gosh, that little piece of bread there, that's, I'm not even going to get that, right? And, 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 and you're, is it worth it? Well, like as a parent, I'd be going, where's the nearest shop? We've got to find something. Is Mac is anywhere close? Surely they'll have something around here somewhere. But there's 5,000 people who decided not to try and fix it, but actually try and sit with Jesus. At the, t- at the Last Supper, there's 12 men sitting around the table and 11 decide to stay. And one decides not to. How did that end up for him? Not too well. But 11 decided to stay even when they knew that everything was going crazy around them. And in staying, they received only what Jesus could give. Does that make sense? The Apostle Peter, there in the boat, some strange guy tells him to start fishing on the other side, and he goes, great idea, I will do that because it's worked before. 
And before you know it, he has so much that he realizes that it's God who's done it and there can be nobody else. And is that normal? No, it is not normal. There is no normal there. There is just Jesus there. And what most people would call crazy, Paul would say that's just right-minded stuff right there because you're actually believing for what Christ is actually doing and all because you are becoming a Mary and finding yourself at the feet of Jesus. Let me finish with this as the pill tolls. When we did communion last Sunday morning, uh, we had um, like an esky. <laughs> that's our communion table. <laughs> that's not just the most unchurchy thing to do, I don't know. <laughs> that's the nearest thing we had and that's what we used. We had an esky. We had a, bread ro- a big bread loaf and we had some grape juice in a bowl. And I said to the guys, this is how we're going to do it today. Uh, you're going to go and break a piece of bread off and you're going to take the bowl and the bread to a- another guy. You're going to dip that bread in. You're going to offer it to that person. You're going to speak something out over that person. Uh, so, and it just gets ridiculous from that point onwards. When I say ridiculous, it gets of God. Because Pete jumps up and he goes, okay, I'm gonna, I think I volunteered you, didn't I, Pete? Sorry, mate. But just love, love him. Love this guy's heart. He jumps up, he grabs the bowl, and he grabs the bread. And who, who did you go to first? Who was that? Damien. And he kneels at Damien's feet. Huh. I can't help but cry even thinking about that moment. He kneels at Damien's, Damien's feet. And, and, and as he speaks over Damien, he's speaking words that I know um, for Damien, they were the directly opposite to the way he feels. I don't feel worthy enough to receive these words. And there is Pete speaking over him that he is worthy. Oh, it was so, so beautiful. And then Damien gets up and, and he gets the, the bread and the, the grape juice and he goes and kneels at his, his feet. At Michael's feet, okay, these are profound moments. You don't forget this kind of stuff for you in that. And he kneels at Michael's feet and starts speaking over Michael very much the same. And I'm standing there as like a proud dad of watching these guys and their faith sprout wings. And before you know it, Christ is right there at the dining table and he's speaking words over the hearts of these guys. Words that change, words that transform. Jamie gets up at one point and he comes and kneels at my feet. And he speaks words over me, which I'm not going to speak out here today, uh, but I've treasured them in my heart. Because he, speaks word, he spoke words over me that only pastors say to pastors. And I'm going, where did you get that from? And I started thinking, you drove down the car with Pete. I'm sure he's probably said that sort of stuff to you. And I've walked over to him afterwards because I was so profoundly moved by it. I said, Jamie, where did you get that from? And Jamie goes, I don't know. <laughs> it just came. brother that's normal and if it's not normal in your life let's make it normal is that right this is what dining with the king actually looks like it's messy it's like that's like jamie said it's messy doesn't always look perfect and it's not but there's something so beautiful in it that if these guys had said to me, can we go away this weekend, I would have moved heaven and earth to take them away. That's how much it impacted my life, my world. I love them. They are my brothers. And we don't do guilt and shame. We do family. Let that be spoken over our church today. So I want to pray. And um, I'm going to put a couple of guys on the spot and I'm just going to ask Jamie and and Pete and Craig to come forward. Come on. Just take your your time, it's okay. This is completely unprepared and and now provoked. I'm going to ask them to pray for you. Just whatever the Lord lays on their heart, I'm going to ask them to pray for you. And if you'd like to receive this, I want to invite you to stand to receive it because I want you to hear and be a part of what we did last week. Who wants to go first? Uh, 
Oh Lord Jesus, you are who you are, Lord. We are who we are. Oh, we can't do life without you, Lord Jesus. We can't do life without you. Lord, I just pray in this church, Lord. Pray that you continue to bless this church, Lord. Continue to bless people that are in this church, Lord. Lord, we will leave, lead different lives, Lord. But I ask that you come into everyone's heart here today, Lord. As you have done with the 11 guys that we went away with and now we have family. I just ask, Lord, that you come into our hearts, Lord. Our sins are forgiven, Lord, because of you today, Lord. Because of the blood that you shed over us, Lord. And Lord, you, we don't have to go away. You're in our hearts every single day, Lord. You've given us the tools, Lord. And I said, blessing over this church today, Lord. In your name, Amen. I don't know, I, I don't pray like normal people, what's normal? Look, um, I do pray, I, I pray for the Holy Spirit to enter every single one of you because I know when I come in I was running on the smell of an oily rag and that was like, that was like, a, what do they call it, nitrous oxide. I pray that everybody receives the things that, the things that we need to keep going, the faith, uh, the courage to drive out the fear, the strength to get out there. And look, I don't know if this is me, but oh, he didn't drag me out of there for nothing, mate. He knows how I do things. And to me, it's like, let's get this started, you know, like, and that's how I feel. Um, you know, get someone in front of you and start moving and drag a few behind you as well and start bringing people to God because I've never felt anything like this and I've said to Matt, you know, this should be normal. People should be queuing up the street for this. They don't know how great this is, you know. So I pray that through us all we can help spread this word, you know, because everybody needs this. Everybody needs this. So I pray for us all as a community to find what parts we fit in and what parts we work best in so we can um, start bringing it home to Jesus. Father God, there's, there's brokenness in this room. It's inside every single one of us, including myself. we just desperately need you to um, break in to minister to us on the inside and to declare over us a freedom and I know this message has been spoken in these walls for years I just sense Lord that we need so much more of your work to be done on the inside we just long to be set free Father we long to live by your truth alone rather than by the bondage that we put ourselves in. When we live by lies, false truths, we create our own bar that we can't jump over and then we beat ourselves up over the fact that we can't jump over it. We've got sins that we allow us, ourselves to feel guilty for rather than trusting that the guilt has been removed through the cross. We've got shame that we're carrying, Lord. We can't lift up our head. But the truth is, Jesus, just get a picture in my mind right now of you just walking up to us and kneeling before us and putting your, your hand on our chin and lifting our face to gaze into your eyes, to see your love, to recognise that None of it matters. Your love is far superior. So much greater than our brokenness. So much bigger than our guilt. So much bigger than our shame. It's blasted it away. 
And we just worship you for this, Lord. The truth is that your blood has been shed and it's over these four walls and it's leaking in this room and it's on every single one of us. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would open our eyes that we might see that reality, that we might recognize that you have literally washed us in your blood. The amazing thing about your blood, Lord, is that it doesn't leave us dirty, it washes us clean. We think about Revelation and just how uh, the saints who have dipped their robes in the blood of the Lamb are now wearing robes that are white as snow. Though our sin is red as crimson, you have made us white as snow, as Isaiah says. Father, would you take this truth and would you embed it deep in our souls, deep in our spirits, that we might know on the inside just how deeply we've been washed that we might really cherish and walk in the truth that you have purified us we love you so much and you're a good good father and we pray these things in Jesus name